it's pretty good. I would say better than Central Europe, not as good as Eastern Europe. That's pretty high on a global scale, so thumbs up for the interaction with the girls so far. Sar Experience. Privet is Kazakhstan and welcome to another episode of the Volka Vodcast with me, Connor Klein. This is the Zara Experience and this is my first vodcast from Central Asia. I'm in Almaty, Kazakhstan and the genesis for today's video is actually from uh, some of my clients and also some of you who've been following me on Instagram, some viewers on Instagram. Uh, if, you, if you're not following me on Instagram, definitely go to my handle at Zara Experience. You get a and look behind the scenes when I'm traveling a lot more raw and maybe candid footage of what I'm up to on a daily basis and it's very helpful for you to know about what it's like if you come to hang out uh, in the regions that I'm in. Normally of course I'm filming from Eastern Europe so that's Russia, Ukraine and Belarus primarily uh, but I've been in here for the last two and a half weeks in Central Asia. First I was in Uzbekistan uh, going down the Silk Road going to be a stunning vlog from Uzbekistan coming out here on the channel in about two weeks so definitely make sure that you are subscribed and you've whacked that notification bell so that you get notified when I upload that one it's definitely going to be an interesting and a bit of a different vlog to what I normally shoot on the channel so basically the question was Connor what the hell are you doing in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and should you also be interested in coming here if I mean you are a regular viewer of the channel if you watch this podcast so you know that I'm obviously a big advocate of traveling in Eastern Europe, so as I said, Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. So why have I come here? And I'm, today's podcast, I'm going to go through just a few things that you can expect uh, and make a bit of a comparison with Eastern Europe and parts of Central Asia. So when we talk about Central Asia, where the hell am I talking about? I'm talking about Kazakhstan and no, no Borat jokes. It's nothing to do with the film Borat. That was obviously a complete spoof and it was not even shot here in Central Asia. Uh, never mind Kazakhstan it was actually shot in Romania <laughs> and they don't speak Kazakh none of the actors are Kazakh so definitely forget all that uh, this is the five stands we're talking about that were in the Soviet Union that's normally what we uh, mean when we say Central Asia so that's going to be Kyrgyzstan Kazakhstan Uzbekistan Turkmenistan and uh, Tajikistan since Tajikistan is the fifth one now these were five Soviet Socialist Republics and that's why we call them the five stands. Now you could have said Central Asia also includes Afghanistan, parts of Iran, but the Soviets and the Russians never conquered that area. It's actually the British who prevented them from going that far. So we tend to see them as a bit different and I definitely for your purposes in terms of having experience that's uh, at least associated with Eastern Europe then yes uh, it, there is definitely a big difference there. Of course the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and it was complete debacle so they never conquered it and managed to influence it that much but here in these five stands definitely there's a huge um, we'll say Russian or Soviet legacy they were part of the same country for a long time and of course Russian is spoken as a lingua franca in the region still it's kind of it's known as the language of inter-ethnic communication uh, because all of the five stands obviously have their own uh, national languages like here in Kazakhstan it is Kazakh and uh, these country, these languages are a little bit similar to say Turkish. They have a lot of loan words from Turkish and some from Arabic I noticed as well looking around in Uzbekistan and seeing things like uh, I think it was maktub for the school. Uh, that's a word that comes from Arabic so definitely nothing uh, that's very familiar if you've learned Russian or another Slavic language. So the first thing I'm going to jump into and uh, it's something that you're most interested in if you watch my channel is what is the interaction with local girls like? What can you expect? Uh, what do they look like? And uh, let me ju jump into that now. So in say Kazakhstan, there's still a lot of, we'll say Slavs, Russians, Ukrainians. Uh, at the time of independence in the early 90s, there were a lot obviously of um, Russians or people from other parts of the Soviet Union, not just Central Asians living here uh, because the one country uh, have been to a certain extent russified and a lot of people have moved to work. In fact, a lot of people are actually sent by Stalin to Central Asia, not really here in Kazakhstan but more to Uzbekistan. There's just a lot of ethnic groups that were sent there and in the late 80s they were allowed to go back to their homelands in principle. So one of those you might be familiar with if you watch my channel is the Crimean Tatars. Uh, they of course were expelled from Crimea and then lived in Uzbekistan primarily and then in the late 80s under I guess um, Glasnost 
and Perestroika and the kind of changes introduced by Gorbachev, they were allowed to start to move back and that accelerated in the early 90s. So a lot of people left here. Um, and that's changed the obviously the ethnic composition since. Actually, there were a lot of Germans, Russland Deutsche, as they're known in German, and they were allowed to move back. So they actually there was actually one million here in Kazakhstan alone. And a lot have lived here in Almaty, but actually more in the north of the country, closer to the border with Russia. Also, there are a lot of Russians there. And uh, one million left, and one million left from Russia and went back to Germany, went back to Germany. They've actually been here for a long time in uh, in Russia, in the Russian Empire, a few hundred years. And also, there were a lot of Russians. Uh, of course, they tended to migrate out of these countries as well and go back to Russia, you could say, um, because well, it was just more, they just felt more comfortable doing that. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of them stayed in some of the countries that were more Russified, like here in Kazakhstan. So officially, it's like about 30% of Almaty is actually ethnically Russian or Ukrainian. So that gives you an idea. Obviously, you're familiar with what that looks like uh, by large if you watch my channel. Now, Central Asians, you have all the different groups. You have, of course, the five stands, so they represent each of the five ethnic groups. So you got Turkmen, Tajik, Uzbek, Kazakh, and Kyrgyz. Uh, they're the five that have their own country, so to say. But then you also have Uyghurs. You might have heard of them from China because they live, uh, a lot of them, in the west of China. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy about how they're treated there. And there are a lot of other smaller groups like Bashkir and I, I don't know, just a myriad of groups that you'll find in the Russian Far East they also live to a certain extent here. Also a lot of Koreans, ethnic Koreans, because they were expelled by Stalin as well to Uzbekistan. And I've seen a lot of Korean restaurants here in Kazakhstan. So apparently there are a lot of Koreans, ethnic Koreans uh, who were expelled or who moved from the Russian Far East near to the border with uh, North Korea and Manchuria and China and they were they came here obviously in like the 1930s and then they stayed and not so many of them went back to Korea <laughs> since the fall of the Soviet Union so you're going to see a lot of those um, other ethnicities that don't actually have their own country or they didn't have their own socialist republic so that gives you an idea so it's going to be about two-thirds I say in this city is Kazakh uh, and that's actually been increasing gradually I had a look at the historical data so the trend is that it's going to be more and more uh, they're moving other parts of Kazakhstan to the big cities, urbanizing. Also, you have the capital to the north, uh, North Sultan, the capital was created, that was moved in the uh, early 90s. Uh, that was because, well, one of the theories is because they were worried about uh, the, no the percentage of Russians and non-Kazakhs living there. So there were a lot of Germans at the time who actually left. And they wanted to settle that part of the country because it was close to the border with Russia. And they were worried that maybe one day Russia might decide that the it should be in Russia itself. Uh, you have seen that in Ukraine, obviously, in the last six years, that that was not uh, um, an undue uh, concern to have. So maybe pretty uh, prescient of uh, Nazarbayev, the president, the former president, who made that decision, who instigated that decision. And actually now the capital is named after him because it was known as Astana, now it's known as Nur Sultan. So there you go. So you have an, a little bit of an idea. Central Asians tend to look well, Asian. So... Uh, but they are different to say Chinese. If I mean, we all Han Chinese is probably the bit, biggest ethnic group that you're, you're probably familiar with as being Asian or East Asian. And Central Asians tend to be, I would say, on average, a um, bit taller, for sure. Um, maybe a little bit more darker um, in terms of skin complexion. Uh, and I mean, obviously, their faces look different. It's more um, well Central Asian as opposed to East Asian. So. Maybe Google that, maybe show a few photos of what the people there look like. Uh, and they definitely have a very distinct culture um, that I've seen. Like, for example, here in, well, I'll go to this later in the video, but they're big into horse meat. It's more this nomadic tribesman on the steppe uh, culture as opposed to having a more sedentary culture historically. That's actually why there are not so many cities or historical buildings in the cities here, in particular in Kazakhstan. I'll go into that later in the video. But in terms of girls, I would say, uh, compared to the countries I'm normally in, the look is obviously on average different. You do have people who are mixed between Central Asian and uh, say Slavic, and then you have a certain Slavic minority. That's pretty big here in Kazakhstan, less in Uzbekistan where it was previously. There it's probably in the capital maybe about 5%. And uh, obviously the majority of people there are Uzbek who look a bit different to uh, people here in Kazakhstan. I would say definitely like distinctly different, having gone from one country to the other. And they have a lot of Tajiks also in the cities I visited in 
uh, Uzbekistan, they actually tend to look often more like people from Iran. If you're familiar with that, maybe the Kardashians, no, the Kardashians are Armenian, but <laughs> uh, so definitely not like them. But the, actually the look is actually a little bit similar, I think, to what you would see there. That's why I thought of the Kardashians uh, off the top of my head, but that kind of Iranian Persian look. Uh, you see that quite a bit amongst uh, Tajiks or people in Uzbekistan and a little bit here also in Kazakhstan. I've seen that look, which I actually like quite a lot uh, personally. So you see you have a little bit of diversity in terms of if you happen to be someone who's actually into Asian chicks or have that what's known as a yellow fever, then this is probably a good place for you uh, because the majority of girls are going to look like that, the majority of people look like that. But of course, uh, on my channel, normally we're covering Eastern Europe, so you do have that minority of Slavs. And uh, then you have the slightly more Iranian look, I would say, that you find in parts of the region as well. I've also been to Kyrgyzstan uh, on a previous trip. Um, I'll dive into that in a little bit as well. Again, they look more Central Asian. They look more Asian, we'll say, in terms of features than, say, Iranian in general from what I see. I haven't been to Tajikistan or to Turkmenistan yet. I was going to go to Tajikistan on this trip, but since I've been in Caesar, a bit Tajik, then I can give you my feedback on that look at least. And then Turkmenistan is like the hardest to go to. I'm going to have a video, a tip Thursday about uh, the visa-free regimes and actually Turkmenistan you need a visa for and it's pretty much known as the North Korea of Central Asia, so not too many people go there and it's a bit of a strange place apparently. Uh, but I have to go there myself, maybe on a trip later this year. I will, I'm not sure if I'm going to be really allowed to film very much there, but we'll see. Anyways, so I went out and partied, which is the thing that you want to know about the most. And I also opened up Tinder here to see what it was like. And I would say overall in terms of looks and what is appealing to me, and obviously if you watch my channel you have a fair idea what I, what I like in terms of aesthetic look. I do hang out in the region of the world with the most beautiful women uh, in Eastern Europe. And I, I think that actually the, the level of beauty is quite high here. Um, not just amongst the Slavs, but also amongst Central Asians. Of course, it is a little bit more of a different, obviously, aesthetic look, so a little bit of a different taste. But uh, overall, I would say that there maybe you're not going to see as many beautiful women uh, here in Central Asia as you're going to see in, say, Ukraine or in Belarus for sure uh, but I still think the level is extremely high I would say mm, probably a little bit higher than um, Central Europe so countries like Hungary um, Romania for sure I think it definitely there is a lot better looking uh, Central Asia people in Central Asia on average so definitely I think in terms of just the natural beauty that you're gonna see which is always as guys we're very visual we're primarily visual so this is the most important factor as superficial as that is I would say giving it a thumbs up overall I'm not exaggerating saying that it's going to be a, a similar experience to going to uh, Eastern Europe so Ukraine Belarus or Russia, but in Russia, of course, they have a lot of immigrants from this region of Central Asia anyways, and from the Caucasus, so um, that look is actually a lot more common in Russia than you're probably going to expect, especially if you go to Moscow or St. Petersburg. Uh, it's maybe the percentages change a bit, obviously, Central Asia are the majority here, whilst they're a minority in uh, the big cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, but you're going to be, if you go to those cities, going to have a, a little bit similar taste. You're going to have this mix of Slavs and Central Asians, and they're also from the Caucasus. So I think in terms of the beauty level, definitely uh, impressive, but not at the same level um, in terms of seeing just absolutely stunning women as you're going to see in Ukraine or in Belarus or in Moscow, for example. Uh, but definitely very, very high a level. And I think here in Kazakhstan, actually, girls are very refined. Uh, the level of style is a lot higher than I've seen on average in Eastern Europe. It's definitely in the, the higher echelons, if we're to use that as a... Is also a metric I think it's I was actually quite impressed here in Almaty it is definitely not a poor place at all people have good style there's a lot of um, high-end shops a lot of nice cafes bars so uh, it's definitely very civilized uh, my friend Andy we had a little bit of exchange yesterday he was watching my Instagram stories and he said yeah that he sees that it's civilized is the word that he used um, so definitely that's uh, also with the women definitely very well mannered as well and in terms of how they react to me, obviously you can see what I look at in terms of an aesthetic look. I do speak Russian, always remember as well, which I'll get into as well a little bit later in the vodcast. Uh, and I'm obviously Irish-British, I'm a Westerner. Uh, the reaction was very positive, very positive in general. Um, not sure if that's going to be the same for all foreigners, but because there's so few tourists here uh, and the people seem pretty open uh, and friendly, 
at least in Almaty and Kazakhstan, also in Uzbekistan, I thought um, definitely you're going to be popular if you have my aesthetic look for sure. Uh, if you could, were to come to Central Asia. So that's something also the factory in, um, in how popular you're going to be. Now, most uh, Central Asians are Muslim, not entirely, of course, but most of them are Muslim. They tend to be uh, a little bit more conservative than in Eastern Europe. Um, there are, of course, the 30% are Slavs. That's going to be more or less similar, but they are definitely a bit more conservative in terms of sexual mores. And uh, they tend to dress less alcohol, I would say, on average, for better or worse. <laughs> it depends what you're into. I don't like girls who are very drunk anyways, so that's not such a big deal. But uh, you will see a lot of girls drinking non-alcoholic cocktails. It's not um, like going to Saudi Arabia or something like that. It's not um, extremely religious. Uh, it was part of the Soviet Union where, of course, atheism was what was officially allowed. So they were, I guess, de-religiousized maybe to a certain extent during that period. And uh, so I would think it's pretty similar to say, being in maybe, if I remember correctly, it was a while since I've been there to Bosnia in, um, in the Balkans where people are Muslim overall, but it's not um, extremely religious. So it's um, actually not so different. Maybe, maybe a little bit more religious than being in Western Europe or in Eastern Europe, but not uh, hugely different. But just bear that in mind that it is uh, definitely a bit more conservative. Uh, I thought Uzbekistan compared to here in, uh, in Kazakhstan, in Almaty, is definitely more reserved, a lot more conservative. I did open up Tinder, as I said. Here it's pretty popular, it's clear. Uh, to use Tinder, it doesn't seem to be unusual. There are a lot of girls on Tinder. Uh, in Uzbekistan, I opened it up in the capital Tashkent and no, <laughs> there was very few girls on Tinder and actually out there, it was pretty, uh, there were definitely lots of girls out in the bars and the clubs uh, in Uzbekistan, um, in the capital Tashkent, not in the other cities like Samarkand and Bukhara that you'll see in my travel vlog. There, there was not very much nightlife at all. Uh, Tashkent did have a good bit and I've been to, um, of course, uh, the capital of Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek. And when I went to Bishkek, it was a few years ago now, uh, it, the nightlife didn't really blow me away. Uh, it was definitely better in Tashkent and Tashkent and Uzbekistan is starting to open up since they had a change of government, change of leadership uh, about a year or two back. So uh, that seems to be an up and coming place and definitely is becoming more liberal. Here in Almaty, this is definitely known as the place that's the most liberal in all of Central Asia. And it's pretty cool to vibe out in the clubs and the bars. I was there over the weekend. Uh, Saturday night was actually a little bit weak uh, compared to the Friday night. It seemed like Friday night was the main night. Uh, but it was it was a lot of fun, very awesome. People were very friendly, open, but boys, uh, guys and girls were friendly to me. I didn't have any problems. People definitely drank a lot. A lot of the guys needed to be chaperoned out by the bouncers. So um, I didn't see any violence, but uh, which was different to Kyrgyzstan. When I went to Kyrgyzstan, they were definitely a lot more aggressive and I saw a good bit of violence in bars. And actually a lot of that was directed towards Westerners just in Kyrgyzstan, not here in um, Kazakhstan. So I would say overall, girls, good looking, uh, maybe not the, the top, top level in terms of the number of very, very beautiful girls like you're going to see in Belarus, uh, Ukraine or a big Russian city. But definitely, we'll say just below that and that's obviously very impressive nonetheless. It's sophisticated, friendly, very open here in Kazakhstan, in Almaty. Uh, and, but at the same time, especially if they're Central Asian or Muslim, probably going to be a bit more conservative than girls who are Slavic or from Eastern Europe. But overall, it's pretty good. I would say better than Central Europe, not as good as Eastern Europe. That's pretty high on a global scale. So thumbs up for the interaction with the girls so far. And just, but just bear in mind, it will be a bit different depending on probably the ethnic background and the city you're in. Obviously, if you're here in Almaty, it's very liberal. Uh, compared to being in like Samarkand, which is uh, a very beautiful city, but it is a little bit of a small town feel and there was not much going on at night. So uh, definitely bear that in mind. It's about to a large extent where you pick. So Ukraine versus Uzbekistan, you're definitely gonna have more fun with girls in Ukraine. Um, but you will, of course, like if you've watched my videos, have to watch out for the scammers in Ukraine and that I didn't encounter at all here in um, Central Asia. Uh, in Kazakhstan, it is similar to um, you know Eastern European culture. If you're the guy, you need to lead. You need to. You're obviously going to flip the bill on a date. Um, so it's basically uh, pretty much similar in terms of your approach if you want to have success with the women here. So um, if you are interested in that and getting some, maybe some advice, because I don't uh, bring clients to Central Asia yet, at least 
I'm not really planning to either. I'm going to be focusing on those cities uh, like Minsk, Kiev, uh, the Astrogen in the summer, St. Petersburg in the summer, and Moscow primarily for that. And of course, if you're interested in that, then of go and uh, fill out the application form. You're going to find a link to that below this video in the description. Now, if you are interested in coming to Central Asia, the best way for me to help you is actually if you write me an email, uh, we can set up a consulting call uh, and then I will obviously help you with the advice and the planning of your trip if you're coming here to Central Asia. Uh, of course, that's a premium service. So um, if you think it's a good fit for, you know, my philosophy here on the channel, then definitely write me an email at connorkline at zarexperience.com or reach out to me on Instagram. My handle there is at Zara Experience and we can set up a consulting call. Of course, I will do that for Eastern Europe, but today's video is about Central Asia. So we'll just stick to that today. So that's the first thing and the thing, all, the point that you're always most interested in. Let's be frank about it. So there you have my assessment of what it's gonna be like in terms of the ladies here in Central Asia. Now, the second thing is, it's not just about on the Zara Experience, about chicks is not a pickup channel um, per se although I do give you a lot of dating advice as well and reason in addition to girls obviously that I enjoy traveling to new places is you know sampling the local culture and the architecture and the vibe of the city and Central Asia as I alluded to a little bit earlier a lot of the peoples here they were nomadic they lived on the steppe they didn't build cities like they have yurts here which are big tents in Kazakhstan and you don't have very many big cities that they're were not built by the Russians when they conquered the region. Uh, you'd have some forts and stuff like that. You can go and see. On their hand, there was a huge empire centered in Samarkand in Uzbekistan. And this is, you've probably heard of the Silk Road that brought the riches from China all the way to Western Europe. And the main hub for that, and the empire that controlled it for a long time was, um, well, the leader was Amir Timur, who's the national hero of Uzbekistan. Uh, and they have amazing architecture in places like Samarkand, uh, Bukhara, which I also went to. And there's another city called Hiva, which I didn't get a chance to. It was a little bit further away and a bit harder to get to on this trip. And um, frankly, I'd see enough architecture <laughs> after about a week of it. Uh, we were like, what, about five, five days, five nights in that region. It was absolutely stunning. That is definitely a must-see if you come here to Central Asia now. I personally hadn't gone there before because I didn't want to go on my own. And most of my friends don't want to go on a architectural trip of Central Asia. So I did go with a girlfriend that's going to be in the, the vlog. And I think that's a good way to go and see it. Uh, definitely if you're going to go to Samarkand and Bukhara and the other city here, because there's not going to be much nightlife or opportunities to meet girls. Anyways, so you might as well go with a girlfriend and have a good time there. It's a very romantic place. I must say food was fantastic in uh, Uzbekistan in particular have the national dish pilaf or plav uh, and have different variations of that but a lot of other national delicacies like manti, lakman and I'm gonna shorpa was a soup they also have their own wine it wasn't quite like in um, in Italy or France but it was still drinkable I found so that was the cultural side of things now in the other parts Tashkent has a lot of interesting stuff to see it is a big modern Soviet city it was at one stage destroyed by an earthquake so the Soviets rebuilt it but it feels like being in somewhere like maybe uh, Ukraine or Russia in terms of you know the old Soviets have big boulevards stuff like that but definitely interesting to check out as well here in Almaty uh, architecture is not amazing it's not you know a beautiful city with lots of historic architecture i just have some new buildings you're probably going to see them up here i'm just looking at the viewfinder that's just been bellows over there there's a lot of nice office buildings uh very nice up scale shops and restaurants and stuff like that there but uh, in terms of historical architecture because they didn't build big cities uh, traditionally you're not going to find them uh, in bishkek um, it was not very memorable for its architecture either and Dushanbe looks very similar basically in terms of the architecture the capital of Tajikistan. Uh, Turkmenistan, Ashgabat, uh, it looks bizarre, it's all white marble everywhere, the streets are empty, I watched some other travel vlogs about it, just google Ashgabat uh, or put that into your search bar in YouTube and you'll see some travel vlogs from there uh, and hopefully in the next year I'll also make one for you. Uh, so that's just maybe more a bizarre experience so I think in terms of like the culture and architecture Uzbekistan is extremely strong uh, it has amazing food, uh, and really top architecture, so beautiful there. Uh, and that's definitely worth seeing uh, if you were to come to the region. So I think in terms of that, in terms of nightlife, as I already mentioned, then definitely here it's, and in terms of cafes, restaurants, and just kind of more, uh, a more cosmopolitan vibe, Almaty is 
great, I have to say. Uh, Nur Sultan, the architecture was built a lot in the 90s, a lot of more futuristic buildings. It looks interesting, I haven't gone there yet. Had intended to stop over on my way here, but then my flights changed, so I didn't get my eight hour stop over to actually just go in and look at the architecture. But that is also interesting to see. Uh, it's very colder in the winter, as you can see, I'm in early February and it's probably just around freezing. It's not that cold here in Almata, but in Nur Sultan, it was minus 27 last week. So bear that in mind if you're coming here during the winter, it can get very, very cold. So that's in terms of the cities and the culture. In terms of language, because I know that normally my viewers don't speak Russian, so you probably don't have a great command of the Russian language. That is going to be more of an issue, I have to say, than being maybe in Eastern Europe in the big cities. They just don't have volume of tourists. This, surprisingly, some people spoke very good English here in Almata, in Almaty. Uh, but of course I speak Russian, so especially when I was talking to girls, um, they basically all replied to me in Russian. I had maybe one girl throughout the entire week who tried to speak to me in English. Uh, but you do see that uh, maybe in cafes and some restaurants, if they speak English, it tends to be a very high level. Uh, but otherwise people are maybe a little bit shy about it and I didn't get the impression that it is particularly high. Uh, and it's probably about the same at best as being in Eastern Europe. So pretty low. Don't expect it's going to be like Prague in Central Europe or Poland, like going to Warsaw. No, not at all. That is going to be more of an issue. So definitely it's worth investing um, in learning Russian in general. Anyways, if you're interested in this region, but definitely if you plan to come to Central Asia, probably a little bit more. Um, and interesting, Russian, uh, not everybody spoke amazing Russian if they were young um, in Tashkent. Uh, when I went to the outskirts of the city, I had to do something there. Uh, for an afternoon and actually a lot of people the Russian was not really really good especially if they were young because they're just not used to having to speak it uh, they could understand it but they weren't great at replying so the level of Russian is probably declining overall here in Amata that's not the case um, it's bilingual as a city uh, I would say most people seem to be speaking Russian uh, more than Kazakh here, so definitely if you speak Russian, you won't have a problem. The only place where English I found spoke a lot on the trip was in Bukhara, which is this historic city, uh, a bit smaller than Samarkand, uh, on the Silk Road. There, actually, everyone kept approaching us in English, um, because obviously, I, apparently, I look like an English speaker, and uh, that was the only place that happened, so definitely because that was very touristic, and it was a smaller town, and the the economy depends on tourism. They did seem to speak uh, English and uh, it was actually pretty good, the English that they spoke to me. So uh, probably you're fine if you're doing a touristic experience, but you know on this channel, I don't really recommend that. It's not so interesting for me personally to be on a package tour, be brought over to buy souvenirs, not my scene. Uh, also because I uh, uh, location independence. I can't drag everything with me all the time. So definitely invest in learning Russian, expect the English skills to be at best overall like Eastern Europe, so pretty low. So just a little bit more about the food and the cuisine. As I said, in Uzbekistan, it was pretty top. I really love the food in Uzbekistan. Here in Kazakhstan, because it's very cosmopolitan here in Almaty, there's a lot of good restaurants. The food overall was very good, very high standard. I would say that if you don't like horse meat, it might be a bit challenging because they eat a lot of horse meat. And actually girls in general told me they eat it themselves at home um, who I met here so it's definitely a national tradition it's not just something for tourists or something they have just randomly they eat horses pretty much as much as they seem to eat uh, lamb and beef <laughs> so um, I had a very good horse steak I ate horse at least four times already here I grew up with horses in Ireland we don't eat them <laughs> we just um, obviously ride them and stuff so uh, it is a bit maybe of a weird thing I don't think I like it as much as a good beef steak or a very nice lamb chop, but overall it was very tasty. So just be uh, prepared for that if you have some, uh, like if you were a vegan, which probably not if you watch my channel either. Uh, it's going to be a big struggle in Central Asia because they eat a lot of meat. It reminded me a little bit of the Balkans. It's getting a bit chilly here, so I'm going to conclude on just one final point because I also want to put my drone up since I got it back and actually went cloudy. So it's going to suck my drone footage from Kazakhstan. Infrastructure. Now, my, that's actually also an analogy to the fact that my drone was confiscated as Tashkent Airport. I did get it back. Going to talk about that in the vlog. And um, uh, yeah, so I have no drone footage at the moment. I'm trying to resolve that. Uh, getting some drone footage and some rights to it so I can show it to you in the vlog. Uh, infrastructure was not very good uh, in terms of internet connectivity. It was pretty terrible in Uzbekistan. Uh, for large parts, I just couldn't upload stuff. Um, just in my hotel in Samarkand 
Dalimach. It was actually pretty good in the reception. It was very fast in the reception, but otherwise it sucked everywhere. And also then the phone reception, using it on your phone was not great. A lot of times my Uzbek SIM card just didn't work. I don't know if I was just unlucky but it stopped working quite a few times on the trip. So just be aware, don't expect the infrastructure uh, in terms of yeah, internet to be great in Central Asia. Here in Tash, in Almaty, it's, it's okay. It's not super fast, but it is faster at least than Uzbekistan. I can't vouch for the other areas because it, it was a while ago when it was in Bishkek and then it was, it was fine in my apartment when it was in Bishkek, uh, but not super, super fast. So I definitely thought it was better in Eastern Europe than here in Central Asia. Other issues with infrastructure, the trains are very good in Uzbekistan, very, very good fast modern trains. Uh, it just was a problem uh, as a foreigner because you couldn't buy a ticket online with a foreign credit card, which is like so annoying in 2020. Come on, Uzbekistan. Uh, which meant that basically I had to pay an agent where they charge you a big surcharge just to basically uh, pay with a credit card, is by credit card. It's just stupid to lose that money uh, for that reason. And I did go and buy it in person then the second time. Uh, and yet yeah, I know there was another issue with the terminals. It seems like your foreign credit card will now work in most terminals in Uzbekistan. But most of them were not aware of that, so they told me no, it won't work unless it's a big card. And I said try it, and then normally it works. A few couple of times it didn't. Uh, so it seems to be I've improved a lot. But they didn't think, for example, I could even pay in a foreign credit card uh, at the ticket office for the train. So I was like, yeah, it's not good for your tourism promotion if I have to go and keep withdrawing cash to be able to pay you. Uh, but they seem to be improving that. But the online, not to be able to buy the train ticket is like, come on. Like, what, what year is this? It's 2020. So definitely they could work on that. Here in Almaty, I worked everywhere. My credit card, it wasn't a big deal at all. They add the tip actually here onto the card. You could just be aware of that as well. Uh, then both in Uzbekistan and here in general in Kazakhstan, they add the tip in. It was 10% here in Almaty. Actually, it was 12 to 20% a lot of the time in um, Uzbekistan. Uh, the one thing that I should have mentioned, but it's only getting to now at the end of the video, which is really interesting, is the price level. Price level was extremely low. Uh, if you look it up online, it's one of the cheapest parts of the world at the moment here in Kazakhstan and in Uzbekistan. So a lot cheaper than Eastern Europe, so cheaper than Belarus, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I have to say if you want the kind of lifestyle I'm sure you want in general when you come here. Uh, so you want to go to the nice restaurants, drink the good coffee, go to the nice clubs, drink the good cocktails, hang out in the nice places, smoke the best shisha. Here in Almaty, it was not any cheaper than being in Minsk or Kiev. So this is February 2020, I'm shooting this. Uh, so dramatically cheaper, obviously, in New York, uh, Paris or London. Obviously, obviously, it's still about, it's less than half the price uh, than there. Maybe down as much as a third of the price, I would say depending on what you're doing and where exactly you are, it could be that cheap. So still great value, but uh, considering that it's, a, you know, if I take a taxi, for example, it's basically almost for free in, in the city in Almaty or in Tashkent. It's not gonna cost, it's hard for a taxi to cost more than two euros. It's a little bit over $2. Like to go to the airport, I think, I actually had a friend bring me in, so I had looked it up. It's probably gonna cost me like, I think less than three euros to go to the airport, around, around that kind of price level to get to the airport. Uh, so very, very good value for taxis. Uh, a lot cheaper, half the price than, say, Eastern Europe. But uh, if you go to the nice places, it's probably about comparable. Uh, if Samarkand, on the other hand, it was very cheap in Bukharan to eat in, uh, definitely was half price, I would say, to Eastern Europe. But the accommodation, there isn't as much on sites like Airbnb. As a result, there's less competition on accommodation. It's more heavily, it's maybe more heavily regulated, I don't know, or just local people haven't started to rent out their places as much as you would expect. Definitely like Kiev, for example, or even Minsk or St. Petersburg. So the prices were definitely higher than I was expecting and it was comparable to being in Kiev or Minsk uh, for sure. Uh, whilst if you look at the overall price levels and the rental levels, it should actually be a lot cheaper, but it is not. So overall in terms of price, very attractive still going to be uh, the same as being Minsk and Kiev, which is obviously very cheap compared to even Central Europe, uh, never mind going to expensive Western Europe. Uh, definitely very good in terms of price. Just be aware that sometimes the cognitive connectivity and the infrastructure is not at the same level as you would expect. English, of course, if you're relying on it, also going to be a bit tricky at times. Um, and in terms of the girls, also better than Central Europe. So I think if you're planning a trip and thinking Eastern Europe, Central Europe, or Central Asia, it's in the middle. 
it's definitely going to be a lot more fun and more interesting, I think, than going to Central Europe. Uh, but at the same time, you're probably going to have a better, more czar-like experience in Eastern Europe, in Belarus, Ukraine or Russia than here. But overall, I'm pretty happy with my experience. That is the end of today's podcast. Uh, anything else I should say? Well, obviously, if you're interested in seeing more of the Conference Central Asia, I am going to come back in probably a few months and make a vlog here from Almaty, maybe go to Tajikistan. I will not be focusing on this region. Uh, the channel is obviously focused on Ukraine and Belarus. That's where most of the videos are from. And I will be going more to Russia in 2020. So I would, rather than spending a lot of time here, I, I really want to show you Russia as much as possible, especially do some more content from St. Petersburg and Kaliningrad, which have become kind of a little bit visa-free um, now for European Union passports not for North Americans yet or for UK citizens uh, who obviously left the EU uh, sadly at the end of the month of last month um, so I'll be focusing mainly on content from there over the next year but there's going to be a little bit more from from also Central Asia so if you're particularly interested in Central Asia then obviously subscribe and whack the notification bell so you get notified when I upload the videos here and that's about it if you've been to Central Asia definitely drop me a comment below in the comment section let everybody else who's watching this video know how you got on and I will see you very soon in another video from Central Asia because we're going to edit up the vlogs here before I get back tomorrow I'm flying to Minsk in Belarus magical Minsk Disvidanya. See you very soon. Sar experience.